Well, if you've got a Bible, if you would turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter 4, we're going to start in verse 12 today as we continue our study through Peter's letter here. And uh, let's pray before we open it. Uh, Father, we come to you hopeful in, in what you're doing in our midst in these days. Um, we know that in many ways, these are, are days of testing where we're being tried, we're, we're struggling, and, and you're so often revealing to us either our faith or our lack thereof. And, and so today, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we pray as we open up your word that you would build our faith. Help us to see Jesus more clearly and live lives in obedience to him. And I pray that what we see in this passage would also give us the resources that we need to, to suffer well, to suffer faithfully, and to even find reason for joy as we go through hard days like we're going through. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's read today's passage. Um, 1 Peter 4, starting in verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And so Peter's continuing the most common theme in this book, which is the theme of suffering as a Christian or walking through trials as Christians. And he writes this book to prepare his readers and then by extension us for a life of following Christ that won't be characterized by ease or by constant success or by smooth sailing. But because it's a life of following Christ who went to the cross, then we can expect as his followers who are following in his footsteps to walk through some of the thing, same things he walked through. That if we're faithful, we can expect a life where there are all kinds of trials. And so that's why he opens up this passage in verse 12 by saying, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So he says, don't be surprised by that. And already I think this is a really important reminder for us because we're often completely shocked when trials hit us as Christians. And maybe the biggest reason for our surprise is, is because of the widespread belief in the prosperity gospel. And, and the prosperity gospel claims that God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. And so if you're not prospering, it's because of a problem with your faith or your obedience most of the time. That if you believed more fully, you would be healed. And, and maybe even those loved ones that you're praying for, they would be healed. If you just had more faith, you'd have more money, you'd be more of a baller, you wouldn't be driving what you drive if you had more faith. If you were better, you'd be receiving better from God. And now there are extreme forms of this all over the place. The televangelist who tells you, put your hand on the screen and then send him money so that he can buy the private jet that God wants him to do his prospering in. Um, and then with the, the hope that if you send him money, then you'll get a cash reward for that somehow, that you're sowing a seed and there's going to be a harvest that you reap someday. There are others who guarantee healing and say that God doesn't want you sick. And, and so if you are sick, there, there must be something wrong and there must be some way, some way within, within the resources that the faith provides for you to be healed now in this life. And so that's kind of the extreme form of the prosperity gospel, and it has an awful lot of adherence. Um, I'd recommend the documentary American Gospel, which is still for rent on Prime, that kind of unpacks some of this. But it's by no means just an American gospel anymore. Um, it's, it's absolutely huge in, in the global south. It is all over the place. But I think what our temptation can be is, is that just because most of us don't believe in those extreme forms of the prosperity gospel— our temptation can be to say, well, that whole thing's not my issue. But I think the truth is that most of us are actually susceptible to a more subtle form of the prosperity gospel that works against us when we do walk through suffering. That we do really believe that if I'm doing right, things should go well for me. 
So just for a couple of examples, you work really hard, you live with integrity, you pay your bills, and you have the expectation that because you're working for God, he's working for you. And while you might not be expecting riches, you certainly wouldn't expect calamity either because you're doing everything right. And then when calamity comes, you wonder why it is that God's failed you or your faith has failed you. Or you're doing all you can to raise your kids right. You're trying to raise them to know Christ, to live with integrity, to, to, and, and you're doing that whole thing with the expectation that they'll follow Jesus for the rest of their lives. And you've made sacrifices to try to keep them in the places where they're learning about Christ. And so you wouldn't expect any other results but that they grow up walking with Jesus. But then one wanders and you wonder why you're not seeing a return on all of your sacrifices and your hard work. Or maybe you're asking God to provide ways for you to serve him, and then he answers not with this amazing opportunity, but more with a trial that will sanctify you and shape you and, and that is a painful situation that you have to walk through so that you can grow. And so you doubt and you disbelieve because that's not quite the answer or the opportunity that you were looking for. Or you're headed toward marriage and you are abstaining before marriage. You're expecting that by doing so, you're building the foundation for a great marriage. And you have that expectation that because we did things right, it'll pay off in a great marriage. But then sometimes you get married and the marriage is still hard. And now here's where this is confusing, that there is some truth in this. I mean, for one, God is gracious and he does answer prayers. So God can and does heal when we ask him to at times. Um, the Bible does teach the principle of sowing and reaping. There are a lot of truisms in the Bible where the Bible tells us the way things normally are, that where it's not giving us an airtight guarantee, but it is saying that God made the world to work in a certain way, and if you work it according to his plan and design, often things do work. So for example, Proverb 10.4 says, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so this tells us the way the world works, and it gives us these truisms, but the way truisms work is that everybody knows that there are exceptions. I mean, there are diligent people who work very hard, but then have a medical crisis and go bankrupt and never end up being able to make ends meet on their own. There are children who depart from the ways that their parents taught them. But the way Proverbs are written is they're not written to make a claim that 100 times out of 100 diligent people get rich. That's not what a proverb is. It's a general truism more than it is a guarantee. And so, for example, if I were to say to you, if you change your oil on time, all the way through, you just stick with it, you do all of your oil changes right on time, your car will get 200,000 miles. I mean, that's a, a truism, but we all know that there are exceptions. Some of us drive Nissans, and so like, we're, we're not going to get that no matter what we do. I mean, it's a truism that you could say that 13 seconds is not enough time to drive the length of the field and score and end up winning the game. <laughs> Too soon? Um, <laughs> but it depends on who you're playing. And so it's, there, there are exceptions to normal rules. And, and so we'll speak Proverbs to tell people the way that the world generally works. And they are helpful because they are generally true. Like I want my kids to grow up thinking that, that the, God has made the world in such a way that if they work hard, if they acquire skills, if they get good at what they do, they serve people well, that they'll be able to provide for their family as a result. Now there are exceptions. I mean, people get sick, people lack opportunities. There's real oppression in places, things go wrong, but often it works. And 1 Corinthians 9.10 talks about farmers who sow in hope, that when they go out and they plant seed in the ground, they're doing so hopeful that there's going to be a harvest. That's why they're doing this. And so there are many ways that these laws of, strive, of sowing and reaping do apply in our lives. And so we teach our kids the word, and we keep them around places where they're going to be learning the word of God, and we do so expecting a harvest. We want them to walk with Jesus. We strive for purity because it honors God and his commands are good for us. And it can make things go better in marriage. We work hard expecting to bring home a good paycheck and that's all God-blessed, God-ordained activity. And that law of sowing and reaping does apply to an awful lot of life. There are just like natural good consequences of good decisions. But also often in a broken world, things don't go the way they should. 
You sow those seeds and the crops don't grow this year and there's a famine. The child wanders. The marriage that you worked so hard for is full of trials. And some of it is just brokenness that comes from the, the broken systems in the world because sin has entered in. Some is because of bad choices you've made. Some is because of bad choices and sins that other people have committed that didn't depend on you. And here's the thing. While, while we might never send our money to a televangelist who's promising us riches, very often we'll still believe in a very subtle prosperity gospel when we get bitter against God when he allows suffering in our lives when we question God's existence because we suffer. When things don't go the way they should and we say, why is this happening to me? I try to do everything right. Or we believe, maybe without saying it, that God exists to make me happy. I'm not happy. Therefore, God must not exist. Or something's going wrong with my faith. I must be doing Christianity wrong because this is hard. God must not love me. I must not truly be a Christian. God works all things together for good for, for other people, but not for me. It's not supposed to go badly for me if I try to do good. And so I'm surprised at the fiery trials that come my way. Now, Peter, in this passage, is dealing most specifically that w- with trials that come our way because we're following Christ in a world that opposes him. There, there was persecution growing against the church. There was a great persecution that was about to break out. Where Christians were going to be blamed for burning Rome, and then many of them would be publicly burned because of their faith. And so it was about to be a very literally fiery trial. And, and the most specific application to, of this passage is to Christians who are suffering public ridicule, public rejection, and persecution because of their faith. But most of these principles about suffering can be broadly applied to any suffering that comes our way in a life of striving to faithfully follow Jesus. And so the first thing Peter tells us about it is, don't be surprised. Don't be shocked at trials. That shouldn't be surprising in a life where we're following Jesus, who was the man of sorrows and who went to the cross and died. And that's really the death blow to the prosperity gospel is that Jesus was crucified. Jesus went to the cross, and that's the least prosperous place anyone can go. There's no health there. There's no wealth there. There's no prosperity there. And if we're following him, then we should expect that there will be trials in our lives as as well. Now, this is important. He rose. And we will follow him in that too as Christians. The end game for all Christians is to be in his presence with total healing, total health, total wealth, total prosperity, but those things just aren't guaranteed here in this life. Sometimes God does bless Christians with those things in this life, but they're guaranteed when we rise again and when we see him face to face. So we do, in one sense, believe in a prosperity gospel. It's just kind of a long-term prosperity gospel where, where you might need to put in 90 years before you experience that prosperity, but it is a promise. Delayed prosperity in the presence of Christ is coming our way. But here in this life, there is no guarantee. And in fact, if anything, we're guaranteed the trials. So he says, don't be surprised by him. He goes on in verse 12 and says that those trials came upon you to test you. And this is big, that, that some of the trials that we go through are because of the brokenness in the world. Some are because of real evil that's done against us by, by people. But regardless of the source of the trials that we walk through, regardless of how fiery the trial is, at least a byproduct of every trial that we go through as Christians is that it tests us so that we can see if we believe what we say we believe. I remember in eighth grade, we had to build in technology class, we had to build uh, balsa wood bridges and so little balsa sticks and wood glue, and we kind of spent the, uh, the unit, whatever it was, a few weeks kind of designing those bridges, putting them together, and we, it was a test of the design, it was a test of how well we built them, and then at the end of the unit, they would bring all those bridges and they would put them in a machine that gradually increased the pressure on them until they buckled, and then it would tell us what weight that bridge truss could, could hold. And so we were all kind of competing against one another to see how much weight those things could take. And we really didn't know until the weight was applied. And for us as Christians, God already knows what's in us. He already knows what we believe. He's not testing us so that he can learn some more information. God is is allowing tests in our lives 
so that we can know. He allows trials so that we can have that kind of weight put on our lives. And though he knows what the answer will be, we don't yet. And honestly, we're really good at deceiving ourselves. I'm really good at convincing myself that things are going great in my walk with Jesus when, when everything in my life is going well, when in reality, I'm just in a good mood because things are going well and there isn't any weight on me. And so God at times allows that weight to test us so that we can see what our faith is made of. Will we be ashamed of Christ when our faith is tested in the social environment that we live in? Will we turn on one another and abandon one another quickly when we see faults and flaws in one another, especially the the really frustrating kind? Where do we turn for comfort when we have cause to be afraid? Will we resort to just kind of being our old selves when all the easy parts of Christianity are stripped away and we go through a hard season? The trials that we go through are not good. In fact, many of them come from sheer evil in somebody else. But some of the good that God allows through them is exposing to us what we really believe. Showing to us what what our faith is really made of. So Peter says, don't be surprised when trials come. Recognize that one of their functions in our lives is to test us. And then he says in verse 13, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now what he's not telling us to do is to be happy about the suffering itself. We're told to mourn with those who mourn. We follow Jesus who mourns, Jesus who wept at the death of his friend. If you read through the Bible, we have the Psalms in the middle of the Bible, and an awful lot of those Psalms are the psalmist wrestling with God, like saying, why are you allowing these things? Save me, God. The water has come up to my neck. Why are you so far from me? How long are you going to wait before you answer my prayers? That's all in our Bible, and that's all an invitation for us to pray like that and to think like that and to suffer like that. So be careful about thinking I shouldn't be sad because Christians shouldn't be sad or I shouldn't be disappointed or I shouldn't be frustrated or confused. We don't deny reality. We don't treat our suffering like it isn't real. The Christian scientists, the people who built this building, um, have a view of reality where they say that the material world is kind of like a, a waking dream that it isn't real. And the way that you can avoid all real suffering and not really feel it is by coming to the realization that it's not real. The, the way that you can be healed of your diseases is by coming to the realization that those aren't real, that the material world isn't real. Which, I mean, by the way, I mean, what a contradiction that they built this place not believing in the reality of the material world. But they, that, that was the teaching, that, that y- This isn't real, and so you can just avoid all suffering and not really feel it if you think about it the right way. That's not the biblical view at all. The biblical view of the material world is it is real. It does matter. It's also not temporary. That as Christians, we will die, and one day we will resurrect, just like this whole creation will die and resurrect. And the eternal state of things is not going to be our spirits disconnected, floating off in the presence of God's spirit but you read the book of Revelation and the final end state of things for Christians is material world with Jesus dwelling among us, the lamb as the light of the whole thing. Everything just as it was meant to be back when God made everything in the Garden of Eden. And so the material world is real, which means that our suffering is real. But we're still called to rejoice. Not rejoice at the, at the, in the suffering itself, but rejoice because of what that suffering says and because of the one who's with us. He says all that suffering, to a degree, is a reminder of where we're headed. And this is big, because we tend to treat hardship as an indicator that something's gone wrong in our faith. That things will go easy for us if we're really following Jesus. Things will always go well. We'll we'll see quick success if we're following him. And if things start to go wrong, then that's an indicator that we've gotten off the right path, that we're on the wrong path now. But he says, we should not see a path that has suffering on it as the wrong path. If we're following in the footsteps of Jesus, Jesus' footsteps walked through tremendous suffering. And he says, but rejoice, because that path we're on does end in glory. There is a resurrection coming. So suffering's not an indicator that we're on the wrong path. Everybody will suffer to some degree. And often it can be an indicator that we are on the right path. 
And so if you look at your life and you say, I'm experiencing grief, so did Jesus at the death of his friend. And he really felt it. He really wept. So weep away. But rejoice, not in the loss itself, but in the fact that you're following Jesus' path that will eventually end in glory. You say, man, I'm, I'm experiencing what seems like evil triumphing around me. It seems like the bad people just keep winning. Evil just keeps triumphing. Well, that is bad. And pray about that. Work to fix that to the extent that you can. And rejoice that we're following the one who experienced the apparent triumph of evil all around him, but rose again in glory. And we will too. I'm losing friends left and right because I'm trying to be a faithful Christian. Well, Jesus experienced the loss of most of his followers and he rose in glory. So rejoice. Not at the brokenness in in the relationships, but that broken relationships because of your faithfulness are not an indicator that you're on the wrong track, but that you're on the track that Jesus walked on. I'm not getting any of the answers to any of my prayers. Well, keep praying, keep seeking, keep asking, but keep rejoicing. Jesus prayed that the cup would pass from him, and it didn't. And he was faithful anyways. And he rose again in glory, and you're headed there. So don't feel any obligation to pretend that pain and loss isn't real. Don't feel like mourning is somehow a sin or that you're doing something wrong when there's grief in your life. Weep and mourn, but underneath it all, rejoice at the glory that's coming. Then he specifically mentions being insulted for Christ in verse 14. He says, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So he says, we should expect that we will at times be insulted because of the name of Christ. And we have a hope that God's spirit rests on us during those times. So this isn't just the future guarantee. This is a present guarantee. The present guarantee that God will be with you when you suffer. That God comes to you in those dark places and ministers to you. And this is present prosperity. As Christians, the spirit of the glory of God rests on us. So we can rejoice when we're insulted. Jesus said this in Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Right now, it's already there. It's already waiting for you. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus said, rejoice and be glad. Because you have a kingdom now and you have a great reward that's waiting for you. Now, Peter knows people very well. And he knows what our temptation is. Our temptation is to bring an awful lot of trouble on ourselves, but then treat it like we're being persecuted. I know I would rather believe that I'm a great martyr than that I'm a great jerk. But Peter says here, and I think this is a trap that Christians have fallen into maybe this year more than any year in the last couple of years, where we, we rudely take up a cause We call it a Christian cause, whether it is or not. We behave as jerks, and then we claim that we're being persecuted. And you saw this on extreme sides, or extreme on both sides of of a number of issues over the last couple of years, where, where we bring an awful lot of people not liking us on ourselves, but then we comfort ourselves by saying, well, I'm being persecuted. But Peter's careful to caution us against that. He says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So at first he says some obvious things. I mean, if you are a murderer or you're a thief or you're actively doing evil, you will suffer at the hands of other people and you might be tempted to call it persecution, but it's not. I mean, people don't like people who do evil to them. People don't like people who steal from them. People don't like it when people murder them. That's off-putting. And so, so he says that you might do those things and then suffer as a result of doing those things. Don't call that persecution. And then he kind of goes down into a little more detail and he says, also don't suffer as a meddler. 
This word meddler, it's the, the Greek word alatri episkopos. It's another person's bishop. It's a busybody. It's someone who jumps into affairs that are not his own. And I think there's a certain type of Christian that just kind of likes the drama, that likes to be involved in somebody else's problems even when they're not asking for help, that likes to be in the know about everything. In the New Testament, busybodies are closely associated with gossips. In 1 Timothy 5.13, it says, besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So we like to jump into issues without knowledge. We rush to the defense of someone who's not asking long before we have the information. We join in loving to be outraged. And then we're called on it and we say we're being persecuted. But Peter says there's a shameful kind of suffering. And that's the kind that we bring on ourselves when we overtly do evil and we suffer for it or when we're just annoying busybodies and meddlers. So be, be careful, because nosy people who don't mind their own business aren't being persecuted when people push back. When we're busybodies, we're actually kind of proudly overestimating ourselves. We're overestima- us, overestimating our own wisdom, our own indispensability to be in people's issues, and it comes from this sense, really, that I'm sovereign. I have to rule things. I have to hold all things together. These people would be nothing without me, and Peter says, don't suffer like that. There's a suffering that we cause, and he says it's a shameful kind. But there's also that suffering for faithfulness, and that's nothing to be ashamed of. And so if you're genuinely trying to follow Jesus at your school, and and the other students, it seems like almost as a whole, all treat you poorly as a result of it, he says, don't you dare be ashamed for a second. Don't be ashamed that when you're following Christ, there's persecution that comes your way because you are following in his footsteps. So we hear all this, and we might be tempted to think that, well, if all these problems come our way because we're Christians, it'd maybe just be better not to be one. And I know, talking to high school students, that that this is sometimes the way that you feel. You feel like you're all alone. You feel like there's nobody else in your school who's a Christian. You feel like everybody is out to get you. You feel like they, they hate your faith. And, and that's just the homeschool kids. Um, it, it feels like there's, <laughs> kidding, there's this pressure that's, that's out there. And the temptation is to say, well, I, I don't know if I, I want to be a Christian then. Life would be easier if I wasn't clinging to Jesus. If I wasn't clinging to what he calls me to do in my life. But look at what he says next. In verse 17, he says, For it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Well, it seems what Peter's doing here is he's referring to, there's a number of passages in the Old Testament that kind of express this. And this was the, the prophetic hope that one day when God returned to his people, the first thing he would do is go into his community, his people, the people who believed in him in his temple. And then in that temple, he would serve as a judge and a refiner where he would sift people, he would sort people, he would refine people, he would cleanse his community by judging with, within his people. And then from there, he would go and judge those who didn't claim to know him. And so one passage that kind of has that is Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, uh, verses 1 through 5. I can just read this to you. It says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he'll prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I'll be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. So God goes to his house first, 
in Judges. And then turns from there and judges further. And so it seems like Peter's pointing to this motif to say, yeah, you've got these trials among you. You have these, this judgment in your life. You have these trials and pains in your life. You have this weight that's on you. But remember the story we believe. That right now, judgment has started among God's people. Now is the time for that. So would it be easier to give up on Christianity? He says, no, because nobody's going to escape his judgment. Everyone will stand before his judgment seat. And on that day, nobody will say, it would have just been better to not be a Christian. Verse 18, he says, if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So be careful of taking too short-term a view of, of your suffering. That, that non-Christians have it better because there's less suffering. But Peter's saying, don't forget the plan. Don't forget where this is all going. There are trials for everybody, and Christians might have even more suffering because they're Christians sometimes. And those trials will test us and reveal whose faith is real and whose faith can bear the weight. But there is real judgment coming, and don't forget our hope. So if you're here today and you're not a believer in Christ... What we have to offer you is not prosperity in this life guaranteed. In fact, we can almost guarantee that if you become a follower of Christ, in some ways your life will be harder because you're a Christian. But becoming a Christian is still the absolute best thing that can happen to you. Because none of us are going to be escaping God's judgment. We'll all be tried. We'll all be tested. And sadly, we all fall short. But if we recognize that we're falling short now in this life, we can find forgiveness now. We can come to him by faith, believing that he paid the price for our sins when he went to the cross. He invites us to be forgiven, to be saved. And the way that we are is not by striving our way to him, by working really hard and being religious and doing good. The way that we're saved is by realizing we need a savior, that we've sinned and fallen short of God's glory but then believing that Jesus is that savior. Believing that he died for us and was buried and rose again. And then we turn from our sin and our unbelief and we turn to believe in him and we receive him by faith without contributing any of our own religious works to that at all. We, we just freely receive who he is and what he's done for us. And scripture says, whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah, we'll walk through some trials because we're followers of Jesus but everyone will be tried. And only in Jesus is there salvation. So Christians, trials are gonna come our way, but don't forget where we're headed. We'll be really glad that we were Christians in the end. And then he leaves us with this final exhortation in verse 19. He says, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So if we do suffer for being righteous, he says, entrust ourselves to God. Keep doing good. Trust that he knows what he's doing. And Job suffered as a righteous person, and he said this in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, I will hope in him, yet I will argue my ways to his face. So Job has everything falling apart in his life. He doesn't know why any of it's going on. Everything's falling apart. Everything's bad. And he just starts praying. He starts arguing his ways to God, and he said, going into this, here are the parameters. I'm going to argue my case to God. I'm going to make those prayers in the night. But even if he kills me, there's no way I'm walking away from him. I'm going to trust him. And Peter says to us, keep doing good. Don't let the fact that the laws of sowing and reaping don't seem to be working really well right now, don't let that stop you from doing good. Keep serving those who mistreat you. Keep loving, keep going at it, keep doing good, and entrust your soul to your faithful creator. He is faithful. He does know what he's doing. We will see him. The suffering will end, and there will come a good harvest. Scripture gives a solid promise that though we sow in tears, we will reap in joy. So he says, entrust yourself to God and just keep doing good. Let's pray. 
Well, Father, uh, we confess that often we haven't responded to our suffering like this. We grumble and complain as though you don't know our needs or as though you don't care how we suffer. We argue with your providence like we're wiser and kinder than you are. Our hearts flare up with anger toward you when you don't answer our prayers the way we want you to or when you don't do our bidding. So Father, forgive us for talking back to you. You would be just to wipe us out right away for our sin. But instead, you've chosen to love us and to show us how patient and kind you are with your foolish, weak, and bitter children. So Father, thank you for that. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would take these words and remind us often of them. Remind us often of the humility of Jesus in our place. And even though our hearts rise up every day to accuse and condemn our creator, remind us of the gospel that he stood silent as a lamb and went to be slaughtered for our sin. He trusted himself to his father in all things without fear or grumbling or complaining. When we start to talk back to you, show us our hearts and show us Christ. And even though our sin weighs us down, your goodness lifts us up. And you remind us again and again that despite all of our failures, you are standing today praying and interceding for us. So give us faith. Give us faith to entrust our souls to you. Remind us that you're wiser and kinder than we could ever be. And in response to that, we pray that you would give us the desire and the strength to follow your commands because without you, we can't do anything. Thank you that in the end, you will triumph. Help us even in our weakness now to glorify our Savior whose love will never let us go and whose death and perfect obedience are enough to save everyone who would trust him. So help us to trust you and to do good. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.